Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. All right. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Philip Kopman. Phil is a system safety expert and Carnegie Mellon professor. Phil, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you being here. So um, I recently kind of found out about you through a lot of your LinkedIn posts you've been doing on system safety and autonomous driving and thought they were really interesting, really well informed. It you know, it seems like you, you really go into detail and have like a pretty deep understanding of, you know, what's actually going on and, you know, where you'd like to see things at. And so that intrigued me. You were nice enough to accept my invite on. I appreciate it. And that's how we got here. <laughs> so Got it. I, I'm happy to be here. And I really appreciate that you point out that I'm trying to be fact based instead of incendiary opinion, hand waving based, because uh, if we want to get this stuff right, we we have to pay attention to the facts. It can't all be rhetoric and, and uh, religion. It has to be, well, you know, everyone thought this is going to work. Turns out it doesn't work. Let's have another plan. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense to me. So um, I guess maybe just to go um, kind of off the cuff, like what's your motivation for, for I guess, like kind of some of the um, interest in autonomous vehicle safety recently and, and kind of what do you hope to, you know, see changed in that in that area? I've been doing this a long time, so I don't know. Is inertia a motivation? No, it's, Fair it's more. Than, I actually, <laughs> actually have a passion for safety. I've been doing my safety my whole life. I, I when I was a high school student, I was in 4-H, which is a, it's not a Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, but it's a, a comparable kind of organization uh, for for kids who were living in rural era, areas, which I kind of did. And I did bicycle safety as an activity. That's awesome. Uh, so they don't have Eagle Scout, but they have something kind of close in mind was bicycle safety, where I taught hundreds of school kids fundamentals of bicycle safety. Now, I did not know at the time I was in high school, I would grow up to be an autonomous vehicle safety expert. I didn't know that, but <laughs> I sort of got started there. Uh, and then uh, after after my undergrad, I served in the United States Navy on nuclear submarines. And let me tell you. If you want an environment where safety is sort of front of mind, uh, between going to sleep every night, you know, a few a few yards from a nuclear power plant, that's <laughs> power, and being under a classified number of hundred feet of water, where uh, you know you don't the, if the pipe leaks, it's really bad, uh, and they have this thing called subsafe, which is all about making sure what we used to call it, keeping water out of the people tank. <laughs> you know, people and you really don't want water in there. So, so safety is kind of top of mind, right? So that kept it makes fresh. sense. Uh, and then after I got my PhD, I, I ended up uh, at United Technologies, where I did a bunch of embedded system things, and that wasn't as safety centric. But I got a lot of domain expertise across a bunch of different embedded systems. We're talking jet aircraft engines, where it turns out safety does matter, uh, and, and helicopters, and um, uh, let's see, elevators and uh, air conditioners and automotive. So I got involved in automotive then, you know, a bunch of different things. So I got a really broad background. Very cool. And then I went to Carnegie Mellon and, uh, Wait, after you had your contracts. PhD, you went to Carnegie Mellon. So, so I had my, so I had my PhD. I went to United technologies. Oh, I was also at Harris semiconductor as a chip designer. So oh, cool. I've seen a lot of stuff. So, and, and that, that chip, um, that chip almost got into a car. So we were a finalist for the Ford engine controller when they were going to go to a 32-bit CPU. That's cool. So, so I learned some automotive stuff. Uh, went to United Technologies, did automotive stuff there, uh, and did automotive security, as it turns out, but also did a lot of applications across all those things I talked about. Then I went to Carnegie Mellon, became a professor, and uh, one of my projects there was sophomore robustness testing. So you may have heard of fuzzing or something like this. Well, this is a cousin to fuzzing that we were able to find structured ways to crash Windows and Linux and all these oh, cool. industrial strength operating systems. It's like, here's the line of code that does it. We <laughs> had an automatic way of figuring out which line of code would take down the operating system. 
which was kind of cool for its day. How did you do that? Did you just cycle through known lines? Did you tweak, you know, certain so tuning? Everyone else had used random data. Uh, and what we said is now let's not use random data. Let's use random combinations of evil data. Uh, <laughs> you know, send in some null pointers, send in some not a number of floating points, send in some malformed buffers. And it turned out that we uncovered a bunch of problems, even in the highest grade reliable operating systems, we found a bunch of problems. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Uh, but at the same time, there was also something else going on, which gets us back to our story, which is Carnegie Mellon had just sent a self-driving car from across the country. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. It was broken up into two trips, but net, they went from Washington, D.C. to San Diego, 98% hands off the wheel. That was no hands across America, I think. No, you, Excellent. Yes. No hands <laughs> plus across America. Okay. Uh, t- uh, Todd Yoakum and, and Dean Pomerleau and Chuck Thorpe was in charge of the project and all this stuff is going on in 1995. Wow. And as the, the alums of that exercise like to say, since 1995, everyone's been working on that last 2%. Right? <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> after that had been done, I was not quite at Carnegie Mellon. I showed up right after that. They said, you know, maybe we should think about safety for this stuff. <laughs> and, and that's good because if the technology doesn't work, it's, you should be thinking about safety, but there's no resources to do it. Once the technology works and they had some money from the US federal government to do a big scale demo, there was there was budget to do safety. And and I was the, the new kid who was underutilized. And so I got thrown in and said, congratulations, you're the safety guy. Okay, sure, I can do that. <laughs> I had no idea what I was in for. Uh, and so I was the safety guy. And back then it was mostly reliability. It's like, you know, if this car is gonna drive itself you need one more than one electrical system because if your battery fails and takes down the electrical system at 100 miles an hour or 100 kph or 60 miles an hour, that's going to be a problem, right? And so, and what if you have a computer steering and the steering actuator fails? What's your plan there, right? And, and so, a lot of it was if there's no person to mitigate mechanical failures and electrical failures, how much redundancy you need? You need. And, and we all know the software was just hopeless back then, but. You had to start someplace. So we started with the, the electrical mechanical. And over the next 25 years, I got into a lot more software safety, not for cars. Well, a little bit for cars. I did some work. But actually, it was more for other types of applications. Uh, and we can come back to that. But let me let me sort of finish that story. We may want to touch on that. Uh, I learned about safety for a bunch of other applications. And then it came around to cars again. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean... When you mentioned like you got to start somewhere, I feel like you probably mitigated that with safety drivers and in a, a handling procedure so that, you know, you didn't give the vehicle too much room on its own to go horribly wrong. I mean, well, that's my guess. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the no hands across America, there were there were two drivers taking turns, keeping each other awake. And <clears throat> it was a steering system rather than full control, to be clear. But so they just put I it didn't on. Know this. They, they put it on non-smart cruise control. You know, they went in the slow lane, set it at 55 or whatever, and, and it was doing lane keeping. But lane, cool. keeping is the hard, lane keeping is the hard part. Yeah, way harder than... You know, adaptive yeah. cruise control was going to happen without these guys. So they did lane keeping. That was the hard part. And it was really super impressive. That's awesome. What type of sensors were you guys running back then? Just because that's kind of more my area. I'm curious. It, it was a, a camera, a laptop, and an optical flow algorithm. <laughs> that's awesome. And it turns out, even if you don't have lane lines, there's enough ruts in the road and skids and whatever in where whatever stuff in the road uh in the rain you can see the tire marks from the preceding vehicle and optical flow was good enough the 98 percent they told me and i wasn't on this ride to be clear right this is <laughs> uh this is todd and dean but what they said the 98 percent, the two percent was um overpasses in bright sun where they their auto contrast uh adjust flaked out for a while that uh, makes sense and the other one is that the it's good at following whatever the strongest line is, and the lines are always better for the exit ramps than for the highway because they don't get run over as much. And so it loved taking off ramps. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the vast majority of the 98%. But remember, they were they were doing cruise control on a highway, not to, trying to be aggressive in speed. And, and so for the most part, 
they didn't really have to worry about uh, slowing down or braking or any of that. They were just interstate highway. They're just going. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Unless you hit like a truck with a wide load or some or, edge yeah. case, in and, which and, case one of the safety drivers notices, you know, goes out of cruise, slows down. And 2% gives you a lot of time to be able to take care of all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yep. That's- now, the the thing about safety, though, is safety isn't about the 98%. Safety is about the 2%, right? And so they weren't doing safety, and they're like, okay, to get the other 2%, we need a bunch of things, and part of it's safety. So what are some of the approaches that you brought in kind of preliminarily on that? And Well, back then, we were just looking at, you know, by the way, if you do the math, you need like uh, – an alternator and two batteries in, in two or three wiring harnesses on different sides of the car. And because that's how airplanes are built. And if you're yeah, really almost sounds like you're going off NASA standards at that point. Well, well, FAA standards. I mean, okay. but yeah, that's why they have them. Right. Uh, and, and you can say, well, that's too expensive. So let's talk about probabilities and all that. But we just said, Hey, you know, if you just, if you just do the probabilities, you actually need, and we were building on some work that some other folks had done and, and confirming it and refining it. Uh, you know, you need three or four of everything in, in the car guys, so that's unaffordable. And so one of the things we came up with, and I'm not going to claim that I originated this because I have no idea who did, who, who did it. But one of the things we came up with is, well, you know, airplanes have diversion airports and you're going to have to have a diversion plan because the calculations are, well, if you can drive for eight hours, you need four. Well, what say if one breaks, you don't keep driving for all eight hours. <laughs> And, and for my work with uh, Pratt & Whitney Gen Engines back, back in the day, I knew that oh, cool. the spec was, uh, they have some really interesting specs, but one of them is that when one engine fails, you go to another airport, right? Yeah, and, you don't want to fly the rest of the way there on a single engine. Like you yeah, you're try going, to land ASAP. You're going from Detroit to, to um, I don't know, Shanghai or something like that, right? <laughs> or Hong Kong. Back in those days, it was Hong Kong. Uh, you, you really want more than one engine, to be sure. But if if you're on a two-engine jet, which is the Boeing 777 was coming out, and that was the first airplane that could really do these long-haul flights with only two engines. They used to have more than two engines. There's a bunch of three-engine jets, and the third engine was there mostly in case one broke. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. For. And you're over the water. So they had this thing called extended twin-engine operations, ETOPS, ETOPS 180. You can be 180 minutes from the nearest diversion airport and that opens up a whole bunch more of the world to economic flights. That's awesome. Because yeah. you have to be able to do that 180 minutes on a single engine. Otherwise, that's it... correct. And you have okay. to do the probability math. And I, if for my course, I assigned this as a homework problem, prove that it was good enough. And it, it's just barely good enough, but it's How, good enough. What's considered. Okay, so this is an interesting question for me. How do you know what's good enough? Like, what, where is that? Where does that um, line get drawn? Um, uh, R of T is E to the minus lambda T. Did that help? I'm not that good at math, I'll be honest. I, I promise the listeners don't tune out. We're not going there, okay? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right, so we'll just say good enough for now. So, well, no, there's there's some math involved in yeah. this reliability theory, and this is classical stuff, and you know, I teach it in my class. But but the idea is, it's hard to get it's hard to get lucky a bunch of times in a row. You know, if you're flipping a coin, it's hard to come up with 100 heads in a row. It's not going to happen, right? Yeah, and so think about it as you know, a million sided dice where one of two, one or two side of the dice are red and the rest are green, and hey, you know, if you roll those dice often enough, eventually you're gonna get a red, and and that's probably that's reliability math, making sure that when you get a red on one engine, you didn't get a red on the other engine because they're different dice. Okay, so the idea is like if you've got two of those dice, like you're probably yeah. good because you're not gonna well, have well, both come up. Well, red. only one will die at a time. Yeah, and yeah. the other one you can do math and say the number of rolls I have to do for three hours the probability it'll come up red is low enough that I meet the FAA requirement of one fatal airline crash per billion hours with a B. Oh, I see. Okay. That makes sense. That and is- so basically the FAA sets up the probability math so it will literally never happen for any aircraft in the entire fleet of aircraft. That's what they set up. It's per uh, billion hours on that single aircraft, not like on the fleet. No, but, well, per billion air hours of operation. And, and if you do the math, that's like all aircraft of that type that will ever be flown until their wings are ready to fall off. You know, nice. <laughs> what they're saying, it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But you have to draw the line somewhere because, I mean, there's yeah. an infinitesimal well, there's no small point, chance of any. Yeah, there's no point being better than will never happen. Yeah, right. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, there's a quote for you. There's no point doing that, right? Yeah, I like that. And, and, but the car business is much different. The car business, in their standards, they say will never happen to a car. Well, there's millions of cars, so that's a completely different level of safety requirement. 
Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. because there's so many of them out there, the probability that you yeah, have yeah. a narrow window, basically. Yeah, right. Um, Which... So, so let, let, let's so let's get to another part because I, I truncated my experience a little bit just so we could chat. I apologize. There's a little that. more coming. No, that's fine. That was the intent. There's more coming. The more coming is that once I was a professor, uh, I had done a bunch of design reviews. So this is I get on a plane or in a car. And I fly to some city in city or drive to someplace in the middle of nowhere in Ohio, typically, you know, <laughs> or, or New York or Minneapolis or Minnesota or wherever I'm going. Uh, and there's some some factory with a really smart, aggressive founder who's who's created this company from the ground up and is still running it. Uh, and and they make a widget. Like the the thermostats for water heaters or uh, factory automation stuff, or uh, something that welds plastic. You know, the plastic that's impossible to cut apart, you cut your hands on. I, I, I know the guys who make the welding machines okay? nice. <laughs> that, that weld the plastic. I've seen- You're a, talking about the clamshells, the products come in. Big, that's right, that's right. And big, scary power supplies that you can feel the air vibrating in your hair stand on end when you get close to them, you know, really big ones, right? And, oh, geez. And copper. <laughs> well, for the audio only listeners, you can't see this, but, you know, these uh, telephone, telecom power supplies where the cross section of the copper is like this big. I mean, just imagine how many thousands of amps are running through that thing, right? It's like four inches in diameter. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a lot of copper, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a lot of, a lot of current. Listening. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you yeah, for is. that. Yes. Um, and and I've just seen a lot of different embedded systems, and a lot of those ended up getting involved with safety, including some automotive work. Uh, and I wrote a book, uh, the, the Orange Book. Uh, it's an eyesore, but it, that's that way because it jumps out on the Amazon shopping page. There were other orange books at the time. That, that, oh, that's, that's awesome. That's totally the deal. That's totally the deal. Uh, and I wrote this orange book that every chapter is – one of these companies I reviewed got it wrong, and here's what they should have done right. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so that book came out, and and I'm an educator. I work at university. So that was, and and I, uh, that book has informed my teaching for many years. That book is um, more than ten years old now, uh, but it's re-released in paperback, still selling. Go figure. I mean, it's it's. It's the stuff you need to know. Once you know embedded, this is sort of like the mid the mid level course beyond the well, I know how I'm embedded, but I, I want to get better at it. Uh, and so, the story is though that the Toyota unintended acceleration stuff started happening. Right? I didn't so follow this, this story. So, what well, this is more than a decade ago. So, um, there were allegations that Toyota vehicles were suddenly going full throttle and causing crashes. That makes sense. And um, there were there were drivers who were accused of pressing the wrong pedal, but there was some statistical analysis saying these guys were off the chart. And then Toyota said, "Well, that's because it's it's publicized, so everyone's calling in." There, there's a lot of stuff going on there. I have a video for an hour that explains it on a technical level, and I'll let people judge for themselves off the video. Toyota never admitted that there was a software defect, but a court in uh, Oklahoma City found that there was. And then Toyota started settling and they settled 500 plus lawsuits. Wow. After that, after they lost in court and they switched to settling 500 plus just, lawsuits. Just in Oklahoma alone or across the globe? No, across the, across the okay. country. <laughs> yes. Across the country, yeah. The Oklahoma was like the public trial and then they, they had a bunch of federal trials. I was going to spend every two weeks for the rest of my life in a courtroom somewhere near as I could tell. And, and, oh, and, they, and they just started settling. Uh, and they never admitted there was a software problem. They copped a plea toward. Um, uh, deceiving the federal government. There was actually a criminal fine of oh, more wow. than a billion dollars levied by the federal government, but not about software, about uh, sticky throttle pedals, I think it was, in floor men. So, you know, stuff like this. Okay. So so you will hear different seems stories. Like a totally of what different happened. thing. Yeah. You, you'll, but, and, and then there were accusations that they just sort of threw those out to, to have a shiny object for everyone to look at while they allegedly hid software problems. And, you know, it gets messy. I have an hour YouTube video. If somebody wants to see my side of the story, um, other people tell Toyota side, do what you want. I've moved on from that. You know, we can I've moved on my life. description. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it's a it's a really good case study in um, all the things you can get wrong, whether or not they cause the crashes. There were a bunch of things that were objectively really bad about their software and practices, single points of failure and code quality, things like this. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so what's and, and, I, Oh, yeah. How this ties together is, 
is the way I got involved in that case was Michael Barr, who was uh, an embedder, an editor of Embedded uh, Systems Programming Magazine, and you know he was he was a, a pretty well known guy. He and his his team got pulled in to do the source code review, and I got this email from from Mike saying, "Hey, um, you know, basically, can we use your book as a checklist for what to look for?" And so I got them a copy they could take into the secure room, and they used it as a checklist. And the bottom line is, except for one or two chapters that just did not apply, you know, Toyota checked all the boxes and all the chapters. So the next thing you know, I'm testifying saying, in fact, yes, all these things, all these chapters that I wrote before all this happened, that's exactly what Toyota did. And they, you know, they got all the lessons wrong was my testimony. So that got me into automotive safety in a big way. That makes a lot of sense. That's a pretty high profile case. So yeah, pretty high profile. So so uh, so I sort of that's what really launched me in automotive safety. I'd actually done some automotive safety before before it, but not at that scale. Yeah. Uh, and then then some time passes, and I'm still doing safety reviews because I've I've used the safety standards for for rail and chemical process and consumer electronics, a little bit of aviation, a little bit of medical. Uh, I'm leaving out stuff. You get the you get the idea. industrial controls. I've done all these safety standards, uh, and then self-driving cars started happening, and so you know I, I'd done this thing in the late '90s, and it was time to revisit it because it was getting sort of hot, uh, and so that's how I got back into self-driving cars. I'd been doing embedded systems. I'd been doing safety for years and years, and self-driving was kind of ripe. Uh, and the way that happened was there's a thing at Carnegie Mellon called the National Robotics Engineering Center (NREC). Yeah. Big fan. And they do lots of cool stuff, lots of cool robots. If you ever get a chance to tour, which is hard to get, but if you get tour, they have all these really cool robots. Real I actually robots. had a tour when I was a kid. That's the reason I became a roboticist. Yeah, it's very inspiring. Real. So I, I had a group there. We did some research, but the way I got involved was they said, uh, you know, we should start worrying about safety more than than a mechanical electromechanical big red button because software is just, you know, if a robot's going twenty miles an hour locking the wheels is not always the optimum idea, not the best idea, right? Agreed. Uh, and so they invited me to give a talk about um, software safety. And so I go over and I adapt my my Toyota slides and some other slides I've been using for teaching because I was teaching software safety at that point and said, and the slide that had the slide that was the the payoff slide uh, which had the intended effect. I put a snapshot out of one of the automotive safety standards uh, that says, oh no, it was a industrial control safety standard. And it says, artificial intelligence, do not use. <laughs> that got your attention. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it says, do not use. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one. So is that just because you're relying on prob probability and it's just not? No, it's because you can't prove it's going to work. Okay. So if you're, if you're building a, uh, a chemical refinery, or you're building transmission lines, or you're building a um, uh, nuclear power plant, or you're building an airplane, or you're building a train. Uh, you know, I've done some rail work. Uh, if you ever if you ever ride the the people mover at San Francisco, I I did a little consulting gig to help them clean Is up that the BART. The, not well, actually, I worked in the BART too a little nice. bit. Uh, but it's not uh, you know it was a small infinitesimal part, but I did work on some signaling stuff, but cool. also the uh, the shuttle. Nice. Those shuttles are built in Pittsburgh. In, uh, I did not in, know that. Mifflin, in Mifflin, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the ones in Atlanta, the ones in San Francisco, the ones in Pittsburgh, they all look the same because they're all built here in Pittsburgh. Awesome. Uh, and, and, and I take that, when San they Francisco. That, <laughs> when they commissioned that, there was, there was an incident before they opened it up, and, and they wanted me to come in and just sort of make sure that they hadn't missed something, right? So, so I'd done real, but that involved the safety. So I've done all these safety standards all over the place. Uh, and uh, so it was. So now I'm coming into the self-driving car world, actually knowing a lot about a lot of different embedded safety uh, type of that areas. That makes sense, and that knowledge translates more than yeah. not. I feel like across industries, yeah, it translates I do a lot of cross well. Industry work as well. That's right, and there's there's automotive safety standards as well. But the robot guys had never really dealt with those because they had a big red button, and and the big red button doesn't work when you have to do something other than de-energize the system. Makes a lot of sense. And, and so that's sort of how I, that's how I got into the self-driving car safety biz. What was via that interaction. Next thing you know, I've got, uh, I've got a team over at NREC. 
uh, and we're doing robustness testing. Remember that stuff? We're, we're, do, we're doing robustness testing on robots is what we're doing. Nice. But we, we also had uh, support. My, my folks, you know, I, I was the manager. These guys, my guys do all the work. But, but, but uh, uh, the folks who worked for me did things like review safety of the robots that Inork was building. That's really cool and necessary. And I feel like you don't see it in enough robotics projects. Like, I mean, at a certain scale, like there's always a safety engineering component, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and what's often, often not given enough thought is the big red button and locking up de-energizing isn't always what you want to do. Right. Well, sometimes the red button doesn't, doesn't lock up. Right. I mean, like, I I think it probably depends on the system, like what you're trying to be. But then it's a question of, it's a question of, did you do safety engineering for the red button or is it, so I, I've seen I've seen these systems where where there's a big red button. What does the red button do? Oh, it goes to a digital input bin on the primary automation computer, which may or may not be paying attention to that button. Oh, no, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I swear I'm not making this up. And it was a scary. It's like really. So dude, there's a polling button. response to the button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And it's like no, no. The point was that your autonomy computer went out to lunch. Why would you expect it to pay attention to a button that says "Pretty please" with sugar on top? Would you shut down? Did I, <laughs> there's some actuators we had to put in something a little bit ago that were like that. The only saving grace is that they were underpowered. But I mean, okay. we still we. In that case, we decided to cut power was the best way to deal with it, you know, just to the computers and the actuators yeah. and everything. You either want, ideally, you either want inherent safety that just does enough enough energy to do damage or that a power cut really will make you safe. Yeah. And a lot of robo- robots, you actually end up modifying the operational concept so you can achieve that. But at some point, that limits what you can do. And when you go past that, now you need to do a thing called functional safety, which is if there's internal system faults, Make sure you do it. And there's all these safety standards. You have to follow the safety standards, which, by the way, don't like AI and machine learning. Yeah, it makes uh, sense. <laughs> but if you can put a safety envelope around it, we call it, um, The say, well, you know, this, ar- this arm is never supposed to move this fast. Or we did a project for the Army where uh, there was a uh, basically an automated tank. Uh, they didn't let us have the gun, but there was an automated tank. This big crusher or? This is uh, this is uh, no no. There's Spinner, one pass gladiator. crusher. One pass crusher. Oh, the new okay. APD, APD, which is the one pass crusher, bigger, faster, advanced platform demonstrator. As the as the names get boring, the technology gets more mature. Is my rule of thumb. Okay. <laughs> and and also, they wanted the soldiers. They love acronyms. <laughs> they wanted soldiers to be really near. And there's this photo of this guy standing behind a normal uh, parking lot guardrail. And, and this APD going over this big co- piece of concrete obstacle. And when I show that slide and talk, I say, here's, here's a guy standing behind a normal traffic guardrail, nothing special in a parking lot. And he's really close to this thing. It's a little, uh, the, op- the optics, he's further away than it looks, but he's still pretty close, okay? And if this thing could pivot, it's electric, six wheel electric drive. So this thing could, could pivot, turn and take a run at him at full acceleration. And this guy's not going to survive that encounter if that happens. And the safety system that they built and, and my team um, my team uh, reviewed software for and, and made sure was going to be safe according to safety standards is to prevent that from happening. Okay? Cool. Uh, and and what it does is it there's a speed limit. It's like you don't trust. Why would you trust the automation to get its speed limit right? There's, there's a separate enforcement for a speed limit to make sure this thing shut down so if it goes too fast. And the safety argument is we there's a speed limit we can trust because it's an independent safety rated speed limiter. And there's the remote operator with a red button on a radio box that's safety rated for mining. And the speed limit gives that guy enough time to slap the red button and the red button definitely works. Nice. What does the red button do in this case if not just de-energize? de-energize. It de-energize. Okay, yeah. cool. But, so but if you're not going that speed limit and you have yeah. a certain that's distance right. to the vehicle like i mean the laws of physics apply and so you know you're that's gonna right. make a stop and then that envelope that, that's right that's that right and, and the brakes the brakes locked up and if that didn't work there was a backup system and you know i won't go into the details but it was it was pretty solid pretty cool <laughs> so, so so i did a teaser before so let me circle back when you've got a car on a highway that plan doesn't work because at 100 miles an hour you can't lock the wheels you just can't you yeah you'll crash thing, this thing's an off-road vehicle in the worst case was something like if it's in mud and it slides down a hill, so don't do demos on a hill, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're on a, if you're in a vehicle, uh, 
I, one of the early reviews I did was for software parking brake, push button parking brakes back when that was super scary and new. Uh, and, and it was right to be scared until they got, got it together and <laughs> figured that out. Uh, you know, you can't lock the wheels when you engage the parking brake at full speed, which you still can do theoretically. If you lose your brakes, that's what you got, right? So you press the button and it's designed to ramp down the car without locking the wheels. That's pretty cool. And they had to better get that right. <laughs> all right. So, so there, that's where you bring in all these software safety standards to say, uh, we need to make sure the software is of high enough quality that when you need it, it w you can absolutely trust it. Machine learning not allowed. And then from a hardware perspective, I'm assuming it probably has to live on a separate ECU at that point. Because if you're having a fault with your main unit, like you need a secondary system. Oh, to... not just a separate ECU, two separate ECUs. Oh, Intera. I did not know that. Okay. So if your brake controller fails, and many cars have two brake controllers that cross check each other. So if it goes out to lunch, it just shuts down leaving you the parking brake or mechanical uh, hydraulic backup, depending on the car. You have this situation where the main brakes have failed. So you have a parking brake on a separate controller so that the main brake computer decides it's malfunctioning and disappears. The parking brake computer has to be a separate computer, so it's still there. These days, they're trying to do a little bit better, but I'm talking classically, it's a separate computer. Now, that computer has a bunch of software that does really complicated stuff like bringing your car to a stop without locking up the wheels from 100 kph. It's actually pretty complicated. It's not near as bad as high performance, whatever, but it's complicated. Yeah. And so to get that right, if you read the safety standards, you actually need another computer babysitting that one to make sure that computer. <laughs> so that's like a tertiary safety system. Yeah. Oh, well, you have a, a primary system, you have a backup system. And the backup system to be safe has to have two CPUs to keep an eye on each other in case one CPU goes out to lunch, the other CPU rains it in. That's interesting. I, I could go down a whole rabbit hole asking about this, so maybe I'll avoid it so we can cover more ground. But <laughs> yeah, you know, I, so, I have well, so many questions. <laughs> well, so let me let me talk about safety engineering, sure, because that's where we ended up. Okay, safe. Yeah. There's two pieces in safety engineering. One is methodical engineering. Testing does not make you safe. I'll say it again because it's that important. Testing never made anyone safe. What testing does is make sure the engineering is adequate. So if you don't put safety in the engineering, you're not going to get it out just by testing it into submission. It's not going to happen. Okay. And so what the safety standards, every industry has one, including the car companies and every other industry, but the car companies follows their safety standard. Car guys don't all the time or many times for reasons that are escape me, right? But if you follow your safety standard, it tells you you have to use rigorous engineering and the more harm that can be done, the more rigorous the engineering. So you don't just slop out some code, you actually spend a lot of time getting peer reviews and testing and making sure the code is clean. And these are the kind of things I teach in my course, those kind of skills. Um, so that's half of it, okay? And, and the other half is you have to have redundancy because you know things will go wrong. Uh, and so a lot of it is about redundancy management. Yes, you need two computers, but how does, if there's two computers, how do you know which one is the one that's sick and which one's the one's healthy? That's what, what I was going to ask earlier. Says, oh, I'm <laughs> so. healthy. Trust me. It's all good. Right. And, yep. and so you end up sometimes having three computers and one is there just to, to keep the other guys honest. And so you have you know, a voting get, system, like, you like have two or three or four standards. computers de depending. And it's all about, well, some of this redundancy is to tell when the other guy's out to lunch and a different part of his redundancy is to take over when one guy goes out to lunch. Yeah. It makes a lot and of sense. And we're back to the jet airplane. So, so inside those Pratt Whitney jet engines that, that I, I, did my small part on for, to be sure the engineers did all the hard work. There's two engines and each engine has two computers. Cool. And one of the things the computers do is check each other to see if they're happy with each other. And if they're not, they try and figure out who's sick and who's not. If they can't, can't tell, they just shut down and let the pilot deal with it. And that's okay because you got another engine to get you to the nearest airport. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so now, now finally we get to self-driving cars. The reason you don't need four or five copies of everything is you can do what airplanes do. You don't have to continue driving for eight hours. You just need a minute or 30 seconds to get to the side of the road. So you can have a big, strong computer doing the driving, and you can use a pretty simple computer that just knows how to slow down and get to the side of the road. Now, it's very hotly debated how simple that can be, and those are interesting discussions to have. I maintain that if you're smart and look at it the right way, it can be simpler. Uh, other people disagree with me. I don't know. We'll see. But you have to have two computers in case one fails. 
And you can exploit the fact that you don't have to keep driving for eight hours. You can get to the side of the road as long as that doesn't happen very often. If it happens too often, does that just increase the get, load on the secondary system? And well, if it happens too often, you get in the headlines like Cruz and Waymo for jamming up traffic in San Francisco. That's Fair what enough. happens. <laughs> <laughs> or, or if you stop in the middle of the lane, you get hit by a truck. So you don't want it to, you know, there's, there's safety and, and safety is about about uh, if something's wrong, you do a safety shutdown, which is complicated, as we said. It isn't just jamming the brakes. You pull the side of the road, do an in-lane stop, whatever you can. So um, there's safety, but there's also availability. It's like, can you keep operating? Because if the car never moves, it's probably pretty safe, but not very useful, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What happens when that side of the road example like isn't isn't the safest thing to do? Like, I guess there was that famous example with Cruz pretty recently where, you know, pulling over was the thing that caused injury. Um, how do you? Well, well, we can break that down a little bit, but then go more general. Sure. The thing with Cruz wasn't wasn't quite pulling to the side of the road. It was that they had a crash involving a pedestrian. They came to a stop and then they decided to pull the side of the road. Oh, I see. OK. Which is different than pulling to the side of the road after a failure, right? That makes sense. So it was the wrong heuristic for that particular circumstance. Yeah, it was, it was pulling to the side of the road, gets you out of traffic, but it was the wrong time to apply that maneuver. Makes sense. Because there was an unaccounted for pedestrian that you just hit. You know, Not a good time to be moving your car around so you're sure what happened. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, so what I'm talking about is more, oh, you know, I'm at, I'm at uh, 50 miles an hour. Um, something just went wrong. My primary computer just died. Uh, and And I'm on a secondary, but I only have one of those. You know, my, my airplane just lost an engine. What do I do? Keep flying to Tokyo? I think not. I think maybe what I should do is is divert to Anchorage or, or whatever and, and make sure I get on the ground because because I can only trust this engine for a while and it isn't a full 12 hour flight. Yeah. Uh, and so the self-driving cars can do the same thing. And this is my takeaway from back in the 90s was this is the only way this is going to work without costing too much was you have some redundancy, but the the main computer is there to drive the mission and the backup computer's job is not to complete the mission the drive backup driver the computer's job is to get you out of harm's way and into a shutdown so you can figure out what's going on yeah pull to the side of the road stop do whatever you need yeah, to do right. in those scenarios now if that's happening too often you might need two primary computers for availability so if one fails you can complete your mission but that second primary computer isn't about isn't about safety in case of failure it's about just keeping on and you still need this backup computer if they both fail for, for some reason. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and, and so um, what you do is the backup computer only has a 60-second mission life. You may not need two of them because the odds of it dying during that 60 seconds are actually quite low as long as you know it's going to work when you need it. So you're always monitoring, hey, you still okay? You still okay? But you may need a second computer on the pullover one in case of software defects or or other kind of things, you don't need to keep working, but you need to know that it's either working properly or shuts down. And they say, well, what if that one shuts down? It's like, well, we're down to spring-loaded brakes or pneumatic air flask like they have on trains or something, or or probability math that shows it will never happen to any car, so don't worry about it. It's all good. Give me the argument. You know, make, make me believe the numbers make sense. Yeah. So it's just really a case by case basis, depending on the particular. Well, you do a design, you make your trade offs, you run the numbers, you see what it is. Yeah, makes but, sense. But you, I don't see how you can operate these cost effectively without a separate computer that knows how to pull you to the side of the road. If it can, you can't always pull to the side of the road. Sometimes you have to do an in lane stop, and you run the numbers, and you say I'm going to in lane stop this often, and and that's a little bit dangerous, uh, but but I can tolerate it because because compared to whatever, it's still acceptable. And I can pull off to the shoulder most of the time. There's these road segments where I can't, and either I don't drive there, or I have data showing that it's very unlikely I'll be stuck there, or whatever. You, you, do, the, you do the risk analysis, and you decide what, what's acceptable. That makes sense. And that's like a bridge without a shoulder or something, where yeah, you're right. just, there's no and, real estate where you can do that. That's in. right. And, and cars have flat tires. Cars have mechanical breakdowns. I get it. And if you can say, well, it's going to be no more often than a, than a human-driven car, then maybe that's a good enough argument, right? You know, this isn't about perfection. Doesn't but exist. On the, other, on the other hand, saying, well, we shut down because we're safe, and it happened 37 times yesterday to this one car. Well, you know, 
I'm sorry, that's not good enough. <laughs> yeah, yes, I appreciate that you want to be safe, but you have an availability problem. You're you're not fully baked here. You still have baked until you get get it both as safe and as available as a human driver. And the availability is just having that secondary system not be a menace to traffic around it. A, a secondary system to keep going or to say, well, I'm, I have one primary left. I have a limited mission time. I'm going to get to the nearest exit and then do go the parking ride. You know, there's there's a bunch of ways to exploit this concept of a diversion airport. But what you yeah. need is a diversion yeah. airport for the self-driving car. Otherwise, the amount of redundant equipment you need is just- So you expensive. would have to constantly be identifying those diversion paths, depending on where you're at yes. for that to work. Yes. Yeah. So we worked on an architecture. My, my group at NREC worked on an architecture. There's a, there's a patent somebody can look up if they want to. And it was this dual path that there's a there's a primary and there's a secondary. And the primary is self-checking with two redundant computers checking each other. And the secondary is checking each other with two redundant computers. But but the we use a doer checker. So the complicated machine learning is in a single computer. And then there's a pair of non-machine learning sanity checkers saying, hey, you told me that path, but dude, it, it hit something. Uh, I don't like that path. I'm going to say no. All right. <laughs> that makes <laughs> <'Cause>, sense. <laughs> because in a lot of cases, checking is easier than doing, right? That's... You know, here's a path, yeah. and, and the check isn't generate a path. The path check is, so does it hit something? Uh, and so we have this dual channel architecture that we came up with, and that's the kind of thing, you know, you don't have to use that. There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of ways to approach this, but they all end up smelling kind of the same, that you need sort of a main path and a fallback path, and the fallback path doesn't have to be as reliable because it's a very short mission time. Yeah, that makes uh, and, a lot of and, sense. And the main tap path is more capable. It does more optimization. It has better authority. But you can use machine learning path, there. It can't paint you in the corner. The main path can't you take you someplace the backup path doesn't know how to recover from. Interesting. Okay, so you always have the backup uh, path computer checking the main path to make sure it's viable well, well, to recover back, from. The backup is doing two things. What one is it's uh, actually the main has its own checkers to save its sick or not sick. And if it's sick, it shuts down. And the backup is continually saying, here's my backup plan. Here's my backup plan. Here's my backup plan. I don't have a uh, backup and, plan. And, don't do that. And if the ba if we say, I don't have a backup plan, I tell the main, hey, I don't have a backup plan. You better you better shut down. You better do some fancier backup plan. Or or the way we did it was, my backup plan's good for about a second. We're 0.9 seconds in. I don't have another backup plan. Guess what? We're going with my backup plan because you're about to drive me off the edge of a cliff that I don't know how to get out of. Makes sense. That's clever. It would be fun to look at that patent at some point. It's it's out on my website. As no, so everything I'm talking about is. Google patents. <laughs> There's a link from my website to it. Yep. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> really cool. Um, well, so what are some of the projects you're kind of interested in working on next? Uh, what are you currently engaged in that you can talk about that's exciting to you? Um, I guess, uh, you know, what's what's next for you? Uh, exciting is relative. Uh, and, and I'm going to say that because because there's some legal stuff involved. Fair enough. Uh, what I've gotten involved in, well, um, to continue more of my journey. So I got involved with the Toyota unintended acceleration stuff. And then I did a ton of um, different work in all sorts of embedded industries, came back to self-driving. And where I ended up is um, being the originator is the correct technical term of UL 4600, which is a self-driving car safety standard. Oh, cool. Okay. That's awesome. Uh, and there was a startup company involved. Uh, we wouldn't have to go there. That's, you know, but, but they, they sponsored and funded this effort of mine uh, to, to create this standard. And uh, that has actually came out in 2020. Uh, and it's the third edition is out uh, and it covers cars. It covers heavy trucks now. Uh, and it's not required anywhere that I know of, but the engineers and all the companies know about it and they do what they can to to use it as inspiration and guidance. Although no one, none of the companies claims to follow it. But then again, none of the companies claims to follow any of the standards. So I don't feel bad about that. <laughs> but it's sort, of, it's sort of raised the bar on on keeping an eye on self-driving car safety by a thing called safety case. So here's a way to make sure you've thought of all the stuff you need to think of. That's the basis of the standard. Uh, so I did that standard and and that's going and it's being maintained, it's being updated, but I'm sort of moved on from that. I do some other standards work pro bono for the other international standards. But um, what I came to realize is that a lot of the issue here is policy and regulatory and legal. And so I've um, 
spent the last couple of years working with a, a, a lawyer, a law professor, Bill Wyden. And so I'm now published and in the process of a bunch more in legal journals of all places for an engineer. Oh, cool. So I've yes. got all these legal journals. There, there's a bunch of preprints out and, and all of them have been accepted to legal journals in 2024. You're going to see all these legal journals come out with me as uh, most usually second author. Uh, but it's all about policy. And I testified on Capitol Hill last fall. Or, I'm cool. sorry, last summer. Uh, and so I've been, I've become a policy wonk and uh, a legal <laughs> tort law <laughs> guy. You know, I'm the engineer who's spouting tort law, man. I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV even. <laughs> but but I've, I've been able to be effective at explaining to folks you know, what, what the deal is and why we need better regulation, better laws, not to lock this stuff down to within an inch of its life, but just to get a level playing field for, for public safety. So that's what I've been doing. And we're going to see what next year brings. I don't, I've, I don't, in January, I'm going to sit down and decide what I want to do. I haven't decided yet. That makes sense. Having, having some talks right now with people about yeah. figuring out <laughs> my plans. So I totally get it. Um, that's awesome. I, um, the legal path seems like one I feel like no aspiring engineer thinks about when they're, you know, that kid in high school doing bicycle safety, like, ah, I'm going to be writing tort law at some point. That is but correct. It's However, the destination where I got into it, after you. where I got into it was the Toyota unintended acceleration. I, you know, I was there as an expert witness and I had a, you know, you, you go to, you go to Washington to see how the sausage is made. I, I actually did that on a completely unrelated thing with uh, this thing called UCEDA, Uniform Commercial Information Transaction Act, something like that. I may not be getting all those words. That was going to that was gonna legitimatize all the shrink wrap licenses that says you're an idiot for having bought this software. It's your fault if it breaks. And, it <laughs> nothing. and, and, and those were question, uh, questionably enforceable, and it was going to make it really easy to, for the industry to enforce. Uh, and it turned out embedded systems just completely broke all that law. And so I got trotted in as the expert who's saying, you know, this sewing machine, you realize it's a computer, right? Look, look, it's got a touchscreen interface and a three and a half inch floppy disk. Come on, it's a computer. <laughs> <laughs> and they were saying, well, we would never mean it to apply to sewing machines. Well, it's a computer, guys, you know. And and so that thing ran out of steam. Uh, I played my small pip. My small part was just pointing out that trying to regulate computers without regulating embedded systems is never going to work. That's interesting. Yeah. And so I got a taste of how the sausage was made there. Then I got the court experience with Toyota. Uh, I'd, I'd done some other legal patent stuff as well to pay the bills, okay, because professors, you know, we have to pay the bills. So I'd done all this stuff. And um, and so by the time we got to self-driving cars, I had enough exposure to the legal systems to be able to think a certain way uh, and to be able to collaborate with a law professor who actually does know all the legal stuff. Awesome. And so, so that's how I ended up there. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that was actually an answer to your question, but I rambled around. No, I think it was. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I, I kind of asked indirectly. That's but. How I, no, that's how I got there. Is that I, I'd had these regulatory and legal uh, exposures for just that just happened to me, and I already had this experience. And so, a lot of my life has been just randomly getting opportunities and making the most of the experience. Yeah, make, like and anyone all do. who tells you have the better plan than that is probably making up a story. You know, there there are a few people, but not many. Mostly, it's you get some experiences and you make the most of them. Yep, that's interesting. Everybody I know who's a quality engineer, who I've asked how they got to quality engineering, says they didn't find quality; quality found them. Yeah, they. So, you mean they didn't get a master's degree in quality? It's like I don't even think they have those, do yeah, they? I'm pretty sure they don't. <laughs> Not from computer stuff, anyway. You can study systems engineering too, but I feel like I, I don't meet any systems engineers on the job that went to school for that very often. Like yeah, usually, so, it's someone that has a bunch of experience and then decided yeah. to pivot over to systems. I've done a fair amount of system engineering. I started a little bit early uh, doing system engineering. I actually, have a. a a system theory methodology paper from from many years ago that I got in, and when I went to the conference, the the, the senior folks there saw me and said, "We thought you were ten years older to write that paper." And so <laughs> they were like, "Where's your, where's your?" It was a couple of "Where's your gray hair, dude?" You know that was the. That was the <laughs> uh, and the thing about system engineering is you can teach people and you can mentor them, but it is rare to find someone who has the the ability to think the way they need to until they have a lot of miles on them. You just Yeah, I think that's the reason why you don't really see that path of just right. right from a systems engineering degree 
into like you know top level senior systems engineer. You just don't well, you don't see anyone coming right out of school and being yeah a senior it, engineer it's, really. Well, and it, it's because because people can't really do it. I mean, it's you have to have have a diversity experience. Although mil- between military and then go into industry, that helps. That makes a lot right? of sense. Uh, and so you have to have diversity experience. You have to have maturity of judgment. You have to have seen a lot of stuff and you have to have a certain mindset that I've tried teaching people how to be system engineers. And there's a small fraction of people who can just think that way. And it just is what it is. Where would you estimate that percentage at? Like, well, I mean, if you want me to pull a number out of thin air, oh, like yeah, fair 10, enough, like 10 percent of good engineers and good engineers are a fraction of the population. It's really hard to find someone who can think that way. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's just a thinking skill set. Uh, and, and it is as much nature as nurture. I think it's both. That's interesting. Yeah, no, those, those have been interesting jobs to be at. I, the number I would have pulled out of thin air was like 5% of people, but you know, who knows if that's even right. I'm just instinctively. We're, we're both going with, up. it's a small number, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got hired by one company to run a multi-day system engineering course, and the express objective was to take the people they thought were most promising from among hundreds of engineers and put 15 of them, 20 of them in the classroom, some number like that, and have me figure out which two or three were actually going to be their system engineers of the future. And that's about how it worked out. That's awesome. So you've got more data backing up your number than my just, you know. I got a lot of miles for me, man. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've always respected that, though. I mean, there's like the only way you learn things really is through experience. And I mean, you can you can figure things out ahead of time and you should if you're in engineering. But Mm -hmm. I mean, just seeing, you know, diversity of ways things can go wrong or, you know, ways things go right and everything in between. You know, I mean, I I, like you said, I, I feel like that colors your judgment and, you know, your ability to spot failure points before they come up and. I mean, yeah, you just seen stuff, right? And and you know what? This is it's easy to say. There's the old guy yelling at clouds, right? Yeah, <laughs> I get that. But you but go off the rails with it, sure. Myself, <laughs> looking back at myself, I know a lot more than I used to. I'm a better system engineer because of it. It's just inevitable. Uh, and and there's this thing that the, there's when you're young, it's easy to say, "I'm so smart, I can figure it out." Oh, I uh, I never knew more than when I was like 14 years old. I was the smartest yeah, I'd like ever been. People, Peak knowledge, yeah, especially, and you know, they say your parents get smarter. You the measure older it by you confidence. Get. <laughs> well, the older you are, the parent, the smarter your parents get. It turns it's out. It's amazing um, how much the old man learned. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and the way to look at it is, being smart is part of it. But even if you're the world's smartest person, it's hard to synthesize from thin air stuff that just never occurred to you, and the random experiences elicit the oh, I never, I never thought of that. For sure. I mean, it's it's like when you see people in a classroom trying to figure out, you know, like use cases for technology without talking yeah. to the end user. Yeah, they're, they're just going to have blind spots because they just haven't seen stuff. Yeah, and that's yeah, exactly. inevitable. And I don't care how smart you are, if if you don't have the experience, it's going to be hard for you to guess what the the experience will be. Yeah, completely agree. So this there, seems like a, oh, sorry. After you, there's a story from the self driving car world where Waymo put out their drivers to um, supervise and they all fell asleep. It's like, we could have told you that from the nineties. We already knew that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the other one is they, there's a story about they went around and, and weren't worried about construction sites because you know, they were rare. And in, you know, back in the day when I heard that, I was like, these guys are idiots because actually they're very smart people, but, but they lack the context. And one of the lessons you learn as a system engineer is things that are rare with one system aren't rare with multiple systems. And, Meaning if and, you have a lot of instances of robot in a town, eventually you're going to come across a construction zone. Yeah, yes, that's right. Uh, that's more specific. More, more generally, if something happens once every 100 years to a car, uh, and this is how the automotive standards, well, it's 100 years, don't worry about it for the car last 20. I've got a million cars on the road. Let's do th- some math, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be happening. It's going to be happening all the time. Yep. <laughs> Not to each car, but to one of the cars. So you can't ignore it. Yeah. And part of system engineering is just realizing that one in five cars will recognize that during its 20 year life. Yeah. You have to do the math for the fleet size. And and that's fundamentally different than getting the one robot to work so you can get your next research grant. Right. Uh, And and to be sure, I have a lot of respect for the guys who spent decades chasing the next research grant and doing crazy, amazing stuff with robots. That's an important skill set. 
not to be confused with the skill set of how to make something that's scalable where the small stuff all of a sudden does matter. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with that sentiment. Is there anything you want to plug like while we're at the end point, like, I don't know, like a book or just anything you want people to take a look at, um, a general message? Sure, sure. I'll give you an exclusive scoop. No one else has ever heard this before. Okay. Uh, this coming year, I'm going to have a book coming out on checksums and CRCs, cyclic redundancy checks. Okay. It turns out that completely by accident, I'm one of the world's experts on checksums and CRCs. <laughs> As a byproduct of started with rail and automotive safety of all things, I was asked to look at a, a network protocol for trains. Uh, and, and over the years, I've done a lot of work and uh, I'm wrapping it up into a book that I'm, in fact, when I'm done with this podcast, I'll go back to reviewing some of the chapters. It's, it's written, but I have to do uh, some heavy editing on it to clean it up. Makes sense. That's awesome. Well, um, people uh, look out in 2024 for Phil's new book. Yeah, check I, I, you got to be pretty time. geeky to really want. To <laughs> uh, if you're listening to this podcast, podcast, and you've gotten to the end, you probably are. I mean, let's be honest. You probably are. That yeah, that's fair. <laughs> if you got through this whole conversation, you, you're probably the target market for that book. And and the reason I find it interesting is pretty much any embedded system, eventually you have to deal with this. It isn't like a specialty. You don't have. There's the checksum guy in the corner. I mean, it isn't like you have one of those, right? But. Most embedded engineers eventually run into this technology and have to have it. So I'm all the other books are about the math, 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 which is great. This one, I constrain myself by saying I'm not going to use an equation editor. No equation editor. Nice. But I'm doing checksums and CRCs. So you guys can see how that turns out. But the point is well, that's interesting. about yeah. intuition and understanding the why and understanding the how and understanding the limits, not about all the math derivations, which you can get from 20 other books but never did much for me. Yeah, I feel like I would enjoy that read, just being more of an intuitive guy and, and enjoying that sort of thing. Yeah, so that Am so I there's sick? my... <laughs> Check some. <laughs> there's my plug. <laughs> oh, it's funny because it's like, what are you an expert at? Oh, you know, cyclic cadency checks. And it was like, what? Or, oh, I know what those are. And then you can immediately divide the audience into who are the geeks and who are not, right? That's <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.